Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is my skull shirt. Somebody asked me what it was. It's my skull shirt. It just looks like I got, it just looks like the boobs. It's not a skull shirt, I promise. It's a skull shirt. All right. This continues with the Caesar. This is post Caesar. This is number 20. Three. They had 27. They're up to 29. So they're still making them. So I'm going to keep continue to record them. And uh, this is 22 minutes. It's uh, 7:15. So let's do it. There it goes. Following the Battle of Mutina, the Roman Republic was at a crossroads in history. Lepidus and Antony, facing a revived Pompeian faction, thanks largely to Cicero, had allied with one another. Octavian, having been used by the Senate to help fight Antony for them, but receiving little reward or recognition for his actions, had turned his back on the Senate. In this episode, we shall see how these three men would seize ultimate power in Rome. Although Octavian's reputation may be subject to debate, there's no question that Rome's influence is still felt to this day, in part thanks to their artistic contributions to society, well known to the sponsor of this video, Masterworks. For example, there's the mosaic unearthed a few weeks ago in London. Historians theorize it adorned the floor of a dining room in io slash about slash disclosure. My nephew just returned from two plus weeks, I believe, of uh touring Italy and a uh, ton of pictures Colosseum clearly it was, a, it was pretty cool both of the consuls for 43 BC Panzer and Hertius had died leaving the consulship vacant and Octavian furious with the senate that he had not been rewarded for his role in defeating Antony around Mutina decided to act in July, he sent an embassy of centurions to Rome, demanding the consulship and that the decree declaring Antony a public enemy to be rescinded. According to Appian, one centurion addressed the Senate with his hand on his sword and proclaimed, if you do not grant the consulship to Caesar, this will. The Senate refused, pointing out that Octavian was too young to legally hold the office. Octavian's delegation countered, citing Pompey, Dolabella, and other examples of underage consuls. Still, the Senate refused. Octavian's men demanded that he march on Rome to claim the consulship. This is yet another clear example of how symbiotic the relationship between a general and his men was in the Roman Republic. The soldiers gave the general power, which in turn led to political power. While a general's political power was tied directly to how effectively and luxuriously he would be able to reward his soldiers. Octavian's men demanding he march on Rome should not therefore be seen as an act of political idealism, but more motivated by the knowledge that if their general was made consul, they could expect far greater rewards. Octavian gladly accepted their petition, march kind of self-preservation, not self-preservation, that's not what I'm thinking of, but the the enrichment of their own lives, you know, kind of thing. Marching eight legions across the Rubicon toward Rome. Caught between the Senate and Antony, it was now clear that Octavian had made his choice of which side he would join. History was repeating itself with yet another Caesar, which was now Octavian's legal name, marching on Rome. The panicked Senate sent messengers to Octavian saying that he would be granted full command of the army and the right to run for the consulship. However, almost immediately, the senators became ashamed for caving in to blackmail. Two legions that had been sent from Africa to assist in the war against Antony had just arrived in the city, and there was still one legion that had been left by Panzer to protect the city. Cicero rallied the Senate, revoking the previous offer to Octavian. The legions were prepared to defend Rome, and the city was fortified. Octavian's negotiation with the Senate's ambassadors was interrupted by a second delegation rescinding the offer. Immediately, he marched his force to Rome, encamping on the Campus Martius. 
Seeing the vast force assembled against them, two of the three legions in Rome lost heart, defecting to him. The senators had been brave to try and organize a defense of the city, but the popularity and power of Octavian was simply too great. Shortly after this, rumors circulated that two of Octavian's legions had defected, and some senators once again tried to raise legions to confront him, however the rumors were false. In all likeliness, Octavian himself had been the source of the rumor, seeking to establish who his main opponents in the city were. All of them would be proscribed. Elections for the consulship were held, and to nobody's surprise, Octavian was elected alongside Pedius, Caesar's legate, who funded his young heir during the early struggle with Antony. Octavian immediately set about holding trials for those linked to the conspiracy against Caesar, including some men who had not even been in the city at the time. All were unanimously found guilty in the courts presided over by Octavian. One praetor who voted for acquittal would later be proscribed by Octavian, another was rumored to be plotting to assassinate Octavian and was sent on a ship to be exiled in Africa. The ship never arrived though, disappearing en route. This was just a taste of what was to come. Octavian would not show mercy to his enemies. Meanwhile, the forces of Wow. <clears throat> Octavian is a bit of a, a bit of a brute. Meanwhile, the forces of Antony, Lepidus, Plancus, Pollio, and Ventidius had combined west of the Alps in Narbonese Gaul, a huge force of 17 legions, with Antony and Lepidus in joint command. Octavian knew that to confront Brutus and Cassius and the immense force that they could amass in the east, he would need the help of these legions. As such, he rescinded the decree that made Antony an enemy of the state and sent letters of friendship to the two men, who both responded in kind. Between the three of them, they held the most powerful army west of the Adriatic, and each knew that they could benefit from cooperation rather than wasting their men fighting one another. Together, they marched on Decimus's position in North Italy. Decimus's legionaries, seeing the writing on the wall, began to abandon him in droves, <laughs> many turning to either Antony or Octavian. In desperation, Decimus attempted to flee to Macedonia with just his bodyguard, taking a long route through barbarian lands to the north, disguising himself as a Gaul to avoid detection. A Gallic chieftain, loyal to Antony, captured him in September, however, and Decimus was beheaded. It was a severe blow to the Pompeian faction. Decimus had been one of Caesar's most talented subordinates and was one of the best generals on the Pompeian side. With his death, the Italian peninsula was now effectively in control of the Caesareans. In Italy, in October 43, Antony, Lepidus and Octavian met on a small island in the Lavinius River, with five legions apiece lining the riverbanks. On that small island they held one of the most important meetings in human history. It was agreed that Octavian would resign his consulship, Ventidius taking his place. Instead, three new magistrate positions with almost limitless powers would be created. The trio would hold these offices together for an initial five years, could make and annul laws without approval from the Senate or people, and would name the other magistrates for the next five years, and their decisions would be immune from veto. The three men each effectively would hold the same powers as Caesar had. The provinces west of the Adriatic were also to be divided amongst the three, Antony having control over Transalpine and Cisalpine Gaul, Lepidus all of Hispania and Narbonese Gaul, and Octavian Africa, Sardinia, Sicily and surrounding islands. It's clear from this division that Octavian was the junior partner. Gaul yeah. and Hispania were two of the most sought after provinces, the former for its potential for expansion, the latter for its rich silver mines. Octavian's territory, on the other hand, had little to offer. Moreover, Sicily was contested by Sextus Pompey, and a strong Pompeian presence persisted in Africa. Although he carried a powerful name through his adopted father, Octavian was still not as powerful as his fellow triumvirs. Military plans were also laid down. 
Lepidus would remain in Rome with three legions, while Antony and Octavian would lead the main force to Greece to confront Brutus and Cassius. More darkly, they also planned the Proscriptions List, an idea made infamous by the dictator Sulla. A Proscription List was a collection of names that was posted publicly. Any man whose name was on the list immediately had their property declared confiscated by the state and was condemned to death. Effectively, state-approved murders. During the last series of proscriptions under Sulla in 83 BC, a young Julius Caesar had been forced into hiding and may well have been proscribed himself. It was partly for this reason that Caesar had refused to carry out similar purges during his dictatorship. Antony, Lepidus and Octavian were of a different generation, however. The oldest of them, Lepidus, had been just six years old during Sulla's reign, and the prescriptions had left a much less marked effect on them. Together, they wrote up the lists, targeting mainly those with political power, but also personal enemies, and those who were rich, and whose confiscated property could thus be used to fuel the war effort. Even friends and family were not safe, Antony's uncle Lucius was added to the list, as was Lepidus's brother. Cicero, the one-time mentor and ally of Octavian, was also proscribed, though Octavian wow. did apparently try to argue against this for two days before relenting. It is important to note here that Cassius Dio and Paticulus claim that Octavian only took part because he held similar authority, that he was effectively unwilling showing himself later to be a merciful man, and that he tried to save many from the proscriptions. However, other sources, such as Appian and Plutarch, do not say this. In their accounts, all three men were equally culpable. Dio is well known as being overly flattering to Octavian as a result of his position as a senator in the empire, and thus having a vested interest in having a sympathetic view of the emperor. Paticulus has similar problems, serving during Octavian's reign as emperor under Octavian's grandson, and thus having a personal investment in glorifying him. Their views have proved persistent, but the accounts may well be apologist revisionism, and Appian and Plutarch do not offer the same excuses, both putting Octavian on the same level as Antony and Lepidus. Indeed, Appian says that the terrors that would be inflicted on Rome during this time were all the more remarkable precisely because of Octavian's participation, and Plutarch described the trio as having made a barter of murder for murder. Within just three days, the three men had planned how to take full control of the Senate, planned a war against the liberators, and had planned the deaths of 300 senators, about a third of the Senate, and 2,000 knights. Unofficially, the Second Triumvirate had just been formed. After the negotiation... Wow. It's, um... Wow. Yeah. I don't know what to say, hearing all this. After the negotiations, the three began to march on Rome. For now, the majority of the prescriptions were put on hold, but there were 17 men who needed to be targeted early, among them Cicero and Salvius, a tribune of the plebs. Cicero, who held the sympathy of the public, managed to elude his hunters, while Salvius was not so lucky. He was found hosting a banquet when soldiers burst in, ordering the guests to remain in their positions and beheaded the tribune, leaving his guests reclining in shock next to his beheaded corpse. Panic gripped the city shortly afterwards, and Pedius, one of the consuls of the year, publicized the names of the 17 men the Triumvirs were hunting, attempting to reassure the public that only those 17 were listed. Pedius died the following day, reportedly of, quote, political fatigue, unquote but it is not hard to think that he was murdered for having revealed the 17 names. Cicero, having tried to escape Italy by sea, had grown sick and was forced to make land. He was soon found near his villa in Formiae, being carried in a litter. His slaves and other locals had lied about his location to protect him, but he had finally been betrayed by a local shoemaker. 
a centurion, who Cicero had previously defended, found the now 63-year-old orator. He accepted his death, offering his neck, and was executed. Cicero had been the voice of the Republic. Whether one agrees or disagrees with his actions or politics, he was a brave man who, when surrounded by swords, tried to defend his Republic with a pen. In the words of Paticulus, you took from Marcus Cicero a few anxious days, a few senile years, a life which would have been more wretched under your dominion than was his death in your triumvirate, but you did not rob him of his fame, the glory of his deeds and words, nay, you but enhanced them. He lives and will continue to live in the memory of the ages, and so long as the universe shall endure, this universe, which he saw with eye of his mind, grasped with his intellect, and illuminated with his eloquence, shall be accompanied by the fame of Cicero. He knew he was going to be a martyr, in a way. So, yeah. His head and his hands, with which he'd written such damning speeches against Antony, were nailed to the rostra where he had given so many speeches. The triumvirs entered Rome over three days, each bringing a bodyguard and legion, completely disregarding the law prohibiting arms in the city. A tribune of the plebs, Publius Titius, proposed the law that would give extraordinary powers to Antony, Lepidus and Octavian. With their legions and bodyguard prowling the city, the bill was swiftly passed. The second triumvirate was now legally established. Overnight, lists appeared in the forum with the names of the condemned. A reward was also offered, 2,500 denarii for each head of a prescribed man brought to the triumvirs. Rewards were also offered for information on a wanted man's location, while any person harboring a fugitive would also be added to the list. The gates of Rome were blocked by soldiers, and the proscriptions began in earnest. Appian's account of the proscriptions is harrowing. Men hid in sewers, wells, chimneys, ovens, wherever they could, before being discovered, dragged out, and executed by their hunters. One man even hid himself in a dung heap. The soldiers, disgusted and unwilling to reach in for him, simply stabbed the heap with spears until he emerged, then promptly beheaded him. Brothers holding on to one another were executed together in one swing of a sword. Shockingly, even children were not safe. Orphans whose parents had left them with large amounts of money were also added to the list. One was found at his school with his tutor. When the hunters burst into his classroom, the tutor tried to shield the young boy with his body, but both were cut down without mercy. Night after night, the prescription lists were expanded, so none truly knew if they were safe or not. Gangs roamed the city, looking for any of the prescribed, and any opportunity to loot abandoned houses. Fear was rampant. Wives, siblings, and friends informed on their loved ones. I'm getting angry now. Like, I want these three to die brutally. I mean, I want them to be tied and have horses just slowly rip them apart. Because that's not even good enough. Oh, I'm getting angry. You, you hunted down kids who were left with money. Really? Is that what we're doing now? And no one was sure who could be trusted. Even some children, eager for their inheritance, reported on their fathers. With so many be- This is, this is, uh, this is basically North Korea. That's what this is. Being killed, many seized the opportunity to settle old scores, murdering their rivals under the pretense that they had been proscribed. Many simply gave in. This is amazing. Just, just amazing. Many simply gave in, either handing themselves over in order to try and protect their families, or simply waiting for death. Others decided to take fate into their own hands, jumping off rooftops or bridges. Statius, an 80-year-old senator, 
opened the doors of his house to the public and invited them to take anything they wanted. Once his property had been stripped, he burnt it with himself inside. Many wives also killed themselves over the bodies of their husbands, entire families being eradicated. Among these horrors, there were also acts of extraordinary bravery. A senator named Capito, for example, fought in the narrow passage of his doorway, cutting down a number of his hunters before being overwhelmed and butchered. Sons faked the deaths of their fathers and then smuggled them out, one carrying his elderly father on his shoulders. The slave of one senator, upon hearing that soldiers were coming for his master, swapped outfits with his master and took his place in his bed. The soldiers arrived and killed the slave where he lay, the senator dressed as a slave standing nearby. Oh Antony's gosh. mother, Julia, was outraged that her brother Lucius had been added to the list and confronted Antony, defiantly declaring that she would protect her brother and that he would have to kill her too if he wanted his uncle dead. Antony relented, Lucius's life being saved. When the Triumvirs announced an unheard of before tax upon women, Hortensia, the daughter of a famous lawyer, rallied the women and confronted the Triumvirs. She insisted that if Rome were fighting a foreign power, the women would gladly support the state. But in civil wars may we never contribute nor ever assist you against each other. Given the current political climate, it was an incredibly brave act. The Triumvirs needed money. And they let her live? and the confiscation of prescribed property was intended to solve this. Through such grisly methods, the Triumvirs accumulated huge amounts of property, but they struggled to sell them. Many of the richest men were now dead, and many were terrified to bid on the properties, yeah. lest they also be seen as having money and yeah. being added to the lists. Thanks to Hortensia, the tax on women was only enforced upon 400 of Rome's richest, forcing the Triumvirs to compensate by forcing male property owners to lend money to the state. Some men did escape the prescriptions, many flocking to the banners of Sextus Pompey in Sicily or Brutus and Cassius in the east. Sextus even went so far as to offer his own rewards for those that helped prescribed men escape to him. As a result, Sextus, whose situation so far had been rather weak, had an influx of powerful men into his faction including many who had seen military service, greatly strengthening his position. With many of the most powerful men in Rome either dead or having fled the country, Antony, Lepidus and Octavian were left in complete command of Rome. The prescriptions, which began in November of 43 BC, continued for months into 42 BC and cemented the second triumvirate as the masters of Rome. The first triumvirate, consisting of Crassus, Pompey and Caesar, had wielded power through the influence of the three men. It had been founded upon a base of mutual opportunism, had been largely bloodless, and while the three men unofficially ruled Rome, kept at least the facade of the republican constitution. Even the dictatorship of Caesar had relied far more on the political alliances and debts created by Caesar than terror. The second triumvirate was different. It was ratified by law, effectively making Lepidus, Antony and Octavian simultaneous dictators in all but name, and was founded upon fear and death. The purges were appalling for people at the time. By these means, the Caesarian party had seized control of Rome. In the east, however, Brutus and Cassius had been raising a colossal army and consolidating their position. History once again was about to repeat itself, with the Caesarian and Pompeian parties again fighting a battle to decide Rome's fate in Greece. We will talk about this battle in our next episode, so make sure Oh, I hope those three get killed. Wow. Just amazing. Power grabs. It, it, it just... It blows my mind what people will do. It's ridiculous. I'm, I'm angry right now. I'm going to be going to bed soon, and I'm just going to dream about how much I hate these three. <laughs> okay, I'm going to end this here. I hope you didn't mind me snacking on uh, 
big soft pretzel because you know I did it whether you liked it or not and it was delicious okay like and subscribe for more of this wacky content and angering content and until the next video you have a good night and have a good day see what I did there